Okay, so uh, Ross invited me to speak uh, on new diabetes medications, and specifically the title he suggested was should cardiologists be prescribing diabetes medications? So it's a very specific question, and I hope to give you a very specific answer. So these are the diabetes medications that have demonstrated cardiovascular benefits. For the longest time, all we had was metformin. You know, we do have evidence that metformin does have cardiovascular benefits. It took about 20 years for us to see that benefit with the initial UKPDS trial and then the follow-up, 10-year follow-up post-trial in the legacy trial that did show a modest cardiovascular benefit. And all of us believe for the longest time that, you know what, it takes a really, really long time for glucose to affect the heart. And thereby, reducing glucose, it takes a really, really long time for us to see the effect in terms of reducing cardiovascular outcomes. However, now we have several new uh, diabetes medications that um, have really kind of thrown us for a loop in terms of how fast they seem to be showing uh, some cardiovascular benefit. So among these are the SGLT2 inhibitors, and specifically really only one has a completed trial that did show benefit. That's the empagliflozin or Empareg trial. GLP-1 agonists, we now have two outcome studies, one with liraglutide, which is the leader trial, and a second one with semaglutide, which is the uh, system trial, which was published uh, two months ago. And then TZDs are making a bit of a comeback, uh, in particular pioglitazone, which is Actos. And this drug um, is not used very much anymore. I think all of us were a bit burnt by the whole rosy story uh, a while back. However, there has been some good evidence, uh, even early on with proactive, that pioglitazone may work slightly differently compared to rosiglitazone. And then more recently in the IRIS study, um, it's an interesting study, it wasn't in diabetic patients, it was in patients with insulin resistance, and they did see a, a, a positive outcome there, and in particular with non-fatal stroke. So I think we'll see more uh, studies with TZDs coming, and maybe they'll be falling back into f uh, favor again. So just to review, so we do have quite a, a toolbox when it comes to diabetes management, and uh, we know that different agents work at different sites. In particular, since I am focusing on SGLT2 inhibitors and GLP-1 agonists, I'm gonna draw your attention to where those agents work. For GLP-1 agonists, they do uh, their gut hormone. Uh, we all make them, in particular, in response to eating. Um, and they work to increase insulin secretion post-meal, so they work at the pancreas. But they also have an effect on delayed gastric emptying, so kind of delaying the absorption of sugar after eating. And then there are some neuro effects in the hypothalamus where it does affect satiety and the feeling of fullness. So people do lose weight uh, on these medications. As for the role of the kidney, um, SGLT2s do work uh, at the level of the kidney. So we know that the kidney is a, is a big player when it comes to glucose handling. It filters and reabsorbs over 90% of the glucose that it sees. Um, so in a typical person without diabetes, uh, we see about an input of 250 grams of glucose, which comes from diet, but also from an endogenous production. The liver uh, is a main source of that. And then the glucose uptake, where, where it's used, the brain uses about 125 grams per day in, in the average person, and the rest of the body about 125 grams per day. So there is this homeostasis, what goes in is used up, the kidney basically reabsorbs practically everything that it sees, so you don't really lose any glucose uh, in, the, uh, in the outcome. These SGLT2 uh, co-transporters, they're located uh, in the nephron. Uh, Predominantly, the, at the proximal tubule is where the glucose reabsorption occurs. It's co-transported with sodium, so this, this is important because when we start to inhibit that co-transporter, sodium uh, levels get, uh, is affected, particularly at the level of the kidney, and that may lead to some uh, hemodynamic effects locally and systemically. Um, and predominantly, we're talking about the SGLT2 inhibitors that do to carry the load of sodium and glucose reabsorption. SGLT1 uh, reabsorbs the remaining 10% of the glucose. So in an individual with type 2 diabetes, the glucose uptake is the same. You're using the same amount of glucose as someone who doesn't have diabetes. What is different, however, here is that more glucose is present, and that you know, we oftentimes try to blame the diet. Yes, diet can play a big role, but really the main factor here is the, is the liver. The, the liver, liver does produce a significant uh, amount of glucose, and in a diabetic individual, due to insulin resistance, there is an incre increased hepatic glucose output, um, and that contributes to hyperglycemia.
So as you are uh, filtering extra glucose, the kidney is able to compensate for this extra glucose that it sees and reabsorb more glucose. However, there's a threshold beyond which you do get an osmotic diuresis, you do get net glucose loss. And this is why typically you would hear about diabetic patients tell you that when their sugars are very, very high, they need to go to the bathroom more frequently and they feel thirsty all the time. That threshold is around 13 millimoles of, of blood glucose. So underneath that 13, it's still not normal but you're still reabsorbing more glucose than what your body needs. So in order for the SGLT2s uh, to work, it, they have to really cause a net glucose loss at the level of the kidney. They uh, prevent the reabsorption of glucose, and so that you do get a loss of about 60 to 80 grams of glucose per day, bringing you closer back down to what a normal person's uh, in, uh, in, uh, uptake of glucose should be. that there's an increased filtered glucose, but then that filtered glucose, only a very minority gets reabsorbed. The majority does get filtered out and lost. Along with that loss of glucose, you do get loss of calories, and loss of calories leads to weight loss, which again, with these newer diabetes agents, this is a main uh, advantage that both clinicians and, and patients like, is that you do lose weight on these medications. These are the various available SGLT2 uh, co-transporter inhibitors available in Canada. You have canagliflozin, dapagliflozin, and empagliflozin. EMPA is the only one that has a demonstrated uh, cardiovascular benefit uh, in a, a large trial. Um, the other ones are coming. Uh, hopefully, we'll see some uh, similar results. The advantages to these agents is that they are oral. They are once daily medications. They may be combined with any other agent that your uh, patient is on, including insulin. And it also has some kidney protecting effect. So this is seen in the EMPA-REG outcome, kidney outcome trial, where there was a delayed progression of micro to macroalbuminuria. So that's a, another very positive benefit, especially since in this trial, over 80% of the patients were already on ACE inhibitors or ARBs. The sad advantages of these agents is that there is increased risk of urinary tract and genital infections, more likely in patients who have a pre-existing history of, of these type of infections, and more common in, in women than in men. I report rates for women about 10%, and for men about 2% risk of, of infections. Generally, it's a one-time thing, generally easily treated with uh, antifungal medications or um, topical treatments or uh, um, antibiotics. There is a risk of dehydration and low blood pressure because you do get net sodium and water loss, and that can lead to a drop in the systolic blood pressure of about three millimoles mercury, millimeter mercury. And the big one on the bottom, which is not reported very highly in trials, but we do see clinically all the time now, is this increased risk of what is usually called this euglycemic ketoacidosis, which happens in both type 1 and type 2 patients. Classically, we see DKA in type 1 diabetics, but with this particular agent, we're seeing a lot more of it in type 2 as well, and it's believed that it has to do with the way that the kidney is handling bicarb. So you are predisposed to um, a net loss of bicarb as well. So with empaflagosin, it's a highly selective inhibitor of SGLT2, so that may you know, be important when we see these other uh, SGLT2 inhibitors and their outcome studies, because not all SGLT2s are the same. They do have different selectivity for both SGLT1 and SGLT2. Glucose reduction occurs because you're, you're reducing renal glucose reabsorption. And in patients with type 2 diabetes, you're going to expect about a very modest A1C reduction, anywhere from 0.4 to 0.6%, and a very modest weight loss, about 2 to 3 kilograms. But remember, most diabetic patients tend to gain weight over time, and most of our classical agents that we use for diabetes do promote weight gain, in particular sulfonylureas and insulin. And you do see a, a reduction in blood pressure without a compensatory increase in heart rate. So in an MPA-REG trial, um, just to kind of go over how this may apply to the population that you see, so these are adults with type 2 diabetes, average age was around mid-60s, they had, you know, higher body mass index, but less than 45, and an A1C range that is about 7 to 10%. All of them have a history of type 2 diabetes first, 
you know, quite a duration of time. So we're talking beyond five years, closer to 10 years of diabetes. And there was established cardiovascular disease in these patients. So they're considered high-risk patients, either a prior MI, coronary artery disease, stroke, unstable angina, or occlusive uh, PAD. The exclusion criteria for this trial was a GFR of less than 30. So this was the outcome of the study. Uh, the three-point MACE uh, was positive, so showed a reduction, uh, relative risk reduction in the, the three outcomes. However, the main outcome was really driven by cardiovascular death. So there was a 38% relative risk reduction in cardiovascular death uh, in this trial. So that is hugely significant. This is uh, what it is schematically. So this is, um, you can see over the duration of the trial, uh, placebo versus EMPA. They did use two different doses of EMPA in this trial. They did not show a big difference between the 10 and 25 milligrams uh, in terms of the outcome. So I'm just gonna concentrate on EMPA as a whole. And so this is the cardiovascular death. And you can see how the curves separate very early on, even less than three months, you can see a separation of the curves. And that's where it's generated a lot of talk about what is the mechanism here? Why are we seeing such early protective effects of this class of medications? Certainly beyond what we would expect with glucose lowering, and especially with such a very modest glucose lowering. In terms of another outcome that was very significant was uh, hospitalization for heart failure. And again, very early separation of those curves and a hazard ratio of 0.65, so a huge reduction in heart failure. So these are sort of the, the, the areas that's been studied in terms of how uh, SGLT2s and in particular EMPA may modulate factors that contribute or, or, or to relate to cardiovascular risk. So there, there's definitely glucose effects, we know that. There's definitely improved insulin sensitivity uh, with reduction of glucose, so that's good. Um, microalbuminuria, I, I mentioned briefly earlier, so some kidney protective effects. There's hemoconcentration, so we do see some effects on the lipids, so uh, you know, a slight increase in LDL and HDL as well. The decrease in weight, um, not a huge change, but maybe some visceral weight changes, uh, adiposity there that's more, tends to be more atherogenic. Um, some sympathetic nervous system activity, decreased blood pressure, arterial stiffness. So really the, 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 the research is, is ongoing in terms of how the, this medication and this class of medication really seems to uh, improve cardiovascular risk through modulating these various factors. So the LEADER trial, um, which I'll talk about uh, in a second, is a, another cardiovascular outcome trial that came out. This is with liraglutide um, versus placebo, and I'll go over what liraglutide does first, but um, this graph just goes and shows the results. So in terms of GLP-1 agonist, um, it's an incretin hormone. Uh, incretin hormones are present um, as a gut hormone that's secreted in response to food. It stimulates insulin secretion in a glucose-dependent manner, so that's important when we use this class of medications. There's less risk of hypoglycemia because the mechanism of action really depends on glucose being elevated before it works. It reduces glucagon, which is a key hormone that causes hyperglycemia by stimulating, again, hepatic gluconeogenesis and release glycolysis. Um, there's delayed gastric emptying, promotes satiety, and weight loss. So the LEADER trial uh, with liraglutide is a once-daily injectable medication. Um, it was targeting type 2 diabetics who are also at high cardiovascular risk. So the, the patient profile was very similar to, to what you saw in the EMPA-REG trial. They were followed for a bit longer, for five years. And there was, again, a very positive reduction in the three-point MACE, so 13% relative risk reduction, and a 22% decrease in cardiovascular mortality. What, the key differences between this trial and EMPA-REG is that they really did not see a big difference with heart failure outcomes, no change in heart failure hospitalizations. And the most common uh, adverse effect in this case was more GI side effects. And we knew about this. We've been using this medication since 2008. And it does have significant nausea, uh, in some cases very severe uh, abdominal side effects that uh, would cause patients to discontinue this medication. The second um, GLP-1 agonist that's been uh, proven and studied is uh, in sustained 6 semaglutide. This particular GLP-1 agonist is not commercially available anywhere, so it's still in the investigative state. Uh, it is a once-weekly injection, so again, from a patient compliance and tolerability, 
very nice to have a once weekly diabetes medication. The A1C reduction here uh, for all GLP-1s is tremendously higher than what you would see with an SGLT2. So we're talking about anywhere from a 1 to 1.5, even a 2%, depending on the trial, reduction in A1C. So you're going to get a little bit more sugar lowering with this class of medication. And in sustained 6, they also saw very positive reductions in cardiovascular outcome. And a, a, a difference here between this and leader is that they saw 39, that's a huge, 39% decrease in non-fatal stroke, but no difference in cardiovascular death. So certainly there's some subtle differences. Um, so, you know, again, just like I said, not SGL, all SGLD2s are the same. You can s say that about all GLP1s too. There's been other GLP1s studied, um, such as uh, lexizenatine and Alexa. It did not show any positive cardiovascular outcome benefits. So it really, I think there's differences within the class in terms of the agent. And here, you know, different formulations, different ways of giving it. It's good to have two agents that seem to have demonstrated cardiovascular benefit, but we may be able to pick and choose which one we think is more appropriate for our patient depending on their risk factors. So this is the semaglutide um, outcomes. So uh, a very uh, nice separation of the curve between placebo and semaglutide for your primary outcomes. Um, for a non-fatal MI, non-fatal stroke, a big reduction, no difference in uh, cardiovascular death. In terms of what it does for weight, so I mentioned that it does lower hemoglobin A1C very nicely, 1.5%. Uh, so if you can imagine for someone who's sitting with an A1C of 8.5% uh, with metformin, you could potentially add this medication and it will get that person to target without needing to consider a third agent or perhaps insulin. The body weight reduction, again, is uh, remarkable with all GLP-1 uh, agonists, but in particular, uh, liraglutide has probably the best uh, weight reduction of all of the GLP-1 agonists, and liraglutide can be available in even a higher dose. Uh, so usually for diabetes, we use up to 1.8 milligram sub-Q daily. Uh, for obesity, in which it is indicated, you can use up to three milligram sub-Q daily for additional weight loss benefit. So I thought I would go over a few cases that you might see. These are certainly patients that I see all the time at the Heart Institute Diabetes Clinic. And to get your impression in terms of, would you feel comfortable starting a diabetes medication in this patient, okay? So the first case is a 54-year-old gentleman who's seen post-discharge. He had a STEMI a month ago, treated with PCI. He has type 2 diabetes for 10 years. A1C sitting at 7.7% on metformin one gram twice daily, his renal function is pretty good, blood pressure is elevated, and he has a BMI of 30. Would you feel comfortable starting empiphloglosin in this patient? It's a trick question. So the trick here is that the STEMI occurred a month ago. Okay, so in our EMPA-REG study, all patients with coronary artery disease had to have had their event for greater than three months ago. So again, does that apply to our population when we're seeing them so shortly after their acute coronary event? The answer is we don't know, okay? So we don't know in acute population whether there's a difference, whether you're going to maybe affect blood pressure in a different way. I don't know. So certainly, if we're going to stick to indications based on trial, perhaps the one month is a bit too soon, you may want to wait a little bit longer and then initiate uh, an SGLT2 inhibitor. But otherwise, every other feature here would suggest that it would work. He's on metformin, maxed out already, A1C is elevated. You want to get that A1C down. Perhaps with SGLT2, you can maximally get it down about 0.6%, get you closer to that 7% mark that uh, you should be aiming for. So this second case is a 64-year-old man with a history of a non-STEMI six months ago now. And he has type 2 for eight years, hypertension, dyslipidemia. He's on a usual culprit of medications that we treat those conditions with. Metformin, 500 milligrams twice daily. And blood pressure is 135 over 80. BMI is 32. A1C comes back at 8.5%. And he has a good GFR. So question, what is his target A1C in this gentleman? who has had diabetes for about eight years and is 64 years old. 7%, okay, there's no reason to aim for anything higher than 7% or under. 
He is not a frail person, not at the, the particularly high risk of hypoglycemia. He's only on one oral agent. So for this patient, you would aim for 7%. This is not your accord study type of patient where you know, there are multiple medications on a lot of uh, agents that could promote hypoglycemia with CKD, all those other comorbidities that you worry about lowering the A1C too much. So A1C should be 7%. So would, in this gentleman, would you start an SGLT2 inhibitor, or would you maybe consider doing a GLP-1 agonist? GLP-1, okay, why? Greater lowering of the A1C, so he's got an A1C of 8.5%. If I start an SGLT2, I really have to consider something else in addition to the SGLT2, perhaps starting basal insulin, perhaps starting maximizing metformin and starting a third oral agent. So if we want to really get more bang for the buck, I would suggest an SGLT2. He also has an elevated BMI, so for a weight loss benefit, that he, if you're looking for that, you're going to get, again, more effect with a GLP-1 agonist. Now, would it make a difference if he has a history of heart failure? It would, wouldn't it? So, I mean, we don't have that heart failure benefit with the GLP-1, at least not as significant. There was a benefit, a uh, slight benefit in the LEADER trial, but not as significant as what we saw with uh, Empareg with SGLT2s. So if he has a history of heart failure, you may sort of lean towards SGLT2. Um, I know that there's more studies ongoing with heart failure um, and this class of medications, both in diabetes and in non-diabetics. So certainly the time will tell in terms of, you know, what specific heart failure patients would have the most benefit. But certainly, you know, with that medication, I would be inclined to start an SGLT2 if he has a, a history of heart failure. What would you caution him about side effects? Well, it's all the side effects that I described. You would warn him if you're starting SGLT2 that he could have an increased chance of having a UTI or a yeast infection. He should be aware of the signs and symptoms of that. He should see his family doctor if he has symptoms of that. Otherwise, you'll get calls all the time about urinary frequency and bladder issues. Um, and you should also caution him about this euglycemic DKA. And the hallmark of this is feeling very unwell, vomiting, nauseated, can't keep anything down, but blood sugars may not be very high because you're actually still losing glucose in the urine. So you don't see that high glucose that we often tell people that this is a first indication that you're going into DKA. And if that happens, they need to stop the medication right away and seek medical attention. As a precaution, I tell all my patients that if they are feeling sick, if they have the flu, even if they don't think they're in DKA, that they should stop the medication for a couple days. You should probably stop the medication if they're fasting, going for procedures, or going for surgery. So that's with the SGLT2. For the liraglutide or a GLP-1 agonist, the GI side effects, you can go over that. People will tell you right away when they get that. And you really should be titrating the dose very slowly over a couple of weeks. Start at the lowest possible dose, 0.6 milligrams, and then titrate up over weeks to get to that 1.2 or 1.8 milligrams. Incidentally, because it's an injectable medication, uh, sub-Q, uh, any sort of nurse can teach someone how to give a daily subcutaneous uh, injection by a pen in the Heart Institute. I would suggest you track down one of the diabetes nurses to, to help you teach someone uh, how to give uh, liraglutide. In the, community, uh, in the community diabetes education program, they are well trained. You have to just send a form in to say needs uh, liraglutide teaching and they'll be able to book the patient in and teach them how to use the injection. My last case is a 45-year-old woman with a history of CHF. She has diabetes for 25 years, on insulin for 20 of those years, plus metformin. A1C is 8.9%. She has microavenuria, GFR is 50. On exam, blood pressure is 110 over 70, BMI 25. In this patient, would you consider EMPA? Who would start EMPA? Who wouldn't? Who would refer? <laughs> so I actually think in this case, maybe referral is not a bad idea, okay? So there's a couple of sort of red marks here. Number one, diabetes for 20 years, on ins 25 years on insulin, a little bit suspicious, young age of onset, lean body habitus. This is likely, if not a type one, 
a type one and a half, which is LADA, latent autoimmune diabetes in adults. Um, you can tease out a little bit more from that, you know, family history or personal history of autoimmunity that tends to suggest more autoimmune diabetes. But in this patient, the type one and a halves or LADAs, they are very high risk of developing DKA. So you really would not want to start an SGLT2 inhibitor unless you really, really are looking for that um, additional benefit and monitor very, very closely. The, the fact that she's on insulin is not a deterrent for me. I know there are um, lots of thoughts out there that, you know, oh, people on insulin shouldn't be on this class of medications. In your MPA reg trial, 50% of the patients were on insulin. So this is not a deterrent. Being on insulin, if you want to think about it, in some ways may actually be protective for DKA because you're actually inhibiting uh, ketogenesis. However, if someone is looking like they're not quite fitting that type 2 uh, picture, you need to be concerned. Blood pressure maybe is a little bit on the low side, so you may have to be concerned that you don't cause hypotension and symptoms. Um, and the GFR being 50 is not a concern either. So again, with our renal outcomes trial, they really um, are seeing benefits in terms of microalbuminuria renal outcomes down to a GFR that is, is lower than that. So the problem with a low GFR is that you don't end up filtering out as much glucose as you would like to see, so less of a glycemic benefit with the low GFR, but the renal protective effects are still there. So that, again, is not a deterrent. So I'm gonna stop there. Hopefully with these cases, you can now feel more comfortable prescribing some of these medications. Thank you.